What kind of a man was Boaz before he got married? Ruthless. Hey friends, I hope your day's been going really good thus far. Uh, I hope I haven't looked at the weather, but I'm hoping it's as pretty as it is today. You may hear a little bit of noise. I've got a neighbor that is working on a car and listening to some, some pretty rocking music at this point, but I just wanted to be outside. It's so gorgeous. Uh, welcome to week seven of whatever this is, and uh, I hope everybody's safe. Uh, please be safe. Stay safe. If you, if you know of a need, let me or another member of the leadership team know uh, about it, please. Uh, we would typically be voting on uh, replacing the offgoing member of the leadership team, which this year is, is Pete. Um, but obviously we're not meeting right now, and so we're not doing at this point. So uh, if you know of a need, talk to me or talk to Ellen Strong or Corey Wenzel or Pete Matello. Uh, we'll do everything we can as a church to, uh, to make sure that we meet that need, okay? Otherwise, stay safe and reach out to each other. Communicate, please reach out to each other. Uh, that's the biggest thing right now. It's good for us to be physically distanced, but we do not need to be socially distant. Now then, if you will um, join me as we listen to Kathy Hand leading us in prayer this morning. Oh God, our King, by the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, on the first day of the week, you conquered sin, put death to flight, and gave us the hope of everlasting life. Redeem all our days by this victory. Forgive our sins, banish our fears, make us bold to praise you and to do your will, and steal us to wait for the consummation of your kingdom on the last great day, through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hey Threads, this is Erin. I want to say that I miss all of you and seeing you guys in person and can't wait till we get to meet and have worship in an actual building together again. But I uh, hope all of you are doing well. Today I am reading Colossians 16 and 17. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Oh
Ephesians 3, 17 through 19. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Papistry, Sally here, and I will be reading Isaiah 62. For Zion's sake I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not be quiet until her righteousness goes forth as brightness, and her salvation as a burning torch. The nations shall see your righteousness, and all the kings your glory. And you shall be called by a new name, that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall, you shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more be termed desolate. But you shall be called, my delight is in her, and your land married. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. On your wall, O Jerusalem, I have set watchmen. All the day and all the night they shall never be silent. You who put the Lord in remembrance takes no rest, and give him no rest until he establishes Jerusalem and makes it a praise in the earth. The Lord has sworn by his right hand and by his mighty arm, I will not again give you your gain to be food for your enemies, and foreigners shall not drink your wine which you have labored. But those who have garnered it shall eat it and praise the Lord, and those who gather it shall drink it in the courts of my sanctuary. Go the, through, go through the gates, prepare the way for the people, build up, build up the highway, clear it of stones, lift up a single over the people. Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the earth. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your salvation comes. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. And they shall be called the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, and you shall be called sought out, a city not forsaken. Hey, Tapestry. Um, so... Sometimes when we sing uh, worship songs, it feels like we are, you know, singing a happy song or kind of putting on a, a face for God or for each other. And um, not always do we feel like we can just praise and, you know, be happy or feel like we can put on, you know, a joyful face. Sometimes worship calls us to... Um, lament or admit our pain or, you know, just kind of get real about what's happening. And um, so this is a song um, that's about God holding it all together, but also has parts of admitting, you know, either how how scared we are or what the sorrow is kind of doing to our our hearts and how it's kind of under our skin. And, um, and this is not necessarily to enlist an emotional response, but admit that we're emotional people and we, we meet with a God with our hearts in, in trueness and in spirit. And so, you know, during this time of, of, inward struggle, you know, where there's so much happening in the world and all we can do is stay in our house. You know, I thought this song could be um, true to some of our experiences and some of the ways that we need to meet God. So um, I just, you know, want to encourage you guys to uh, be open to the words and open to the Holy Spirit kind of ministering to you uh, in your living rooms with your with your family. So um, you know, if there's any hardness of heart that comes up in reaction to, you know, the emotional sappiness of the song, I, I want you to just kind of be open to what God's doing in your life. And if, and if you are, you know, struggling, you know, I hope this song uh, ministers to you as it has to me um, and, and needing God and hurting. So, um yeah, thanks for listening to my, my intro. <laughs> Like an ocean of sorrow is on.
temptations and fears in our hearts. As soon as your light as we're making our way through the dark, all of our earlier troubles, chaos and pain, they unravel. Man, I wish I was with you guys right now. It's it's weird singing alone. This is my prayer. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Number 6, 24 through 26. Hi, Threads. So my neighbor has gone from working on his car uh, to using his lawnmower, but it's still pretty. And I really like the bird sound, so I'm still staying outside. Uh, I want to start off before I talk about uh, the message. I want to actually say thank you to you guys. Uh, the past six weeks now, seventh week, has just reminded me, uh, one, that we have a church full of very talented people. And that's very true. You've seen that. But also, we have a church full of very gracious people. People are willing to take these chances because they know that you as a church are going to respond graciously. That you're going to look at somebody who's not, not the normal lead singer, uh, not the normal person to produce a video, and you're going to be so thankful for what they do, and you're going to see the beauty in it when sometimes they don't see the beauty themselves. Uh, your grace makes it to where people respond, and I am so thankful for the way you respond to each other in grace. I think it reflects Jesus beautifully. So now then, let's finish our series on John's epistles. Uh, we're going to read the entire third letter of John. Uh, so that's verses 1 through 14. There's only one chapter. Uh, so if you would turn in your Bible to 3 John or listen to me, this is what the word of the Lord says. The elder to my dear friend Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. It gave me great joy when some believers came and testified about your faithfulness to the truth, telling how you continue to walk in it. 
I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Dear friend, you are faithful in what you are doing for the brothers and sisters, even though they are strangers to you. They have told the church about your love. Please send them on their way in a manner that honors God. It was for the sake of the name that they went out, receiving no help from the pagans. We ought, therefore, to show hospitality to such people so that we may work together for the truth. I wrote to the church, uh, but Deophatries, uh, who loves to be first, uh, will not welcome us. So when I come, I will call attention to what he is doing, spreading malicious nonsense about us. Not satisfied with that, he even refuses to welcome other believers. He also stops those who want to do so and puts them out of the church. Dear friend, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. Anyone who does what is good is from God. Anyone who does what is evil is not, has not seen God. Demetrius is well spoken of by everyone and even by the truth itself. We also speak well of him, and you know that our testimony is true. I have much to write you, but I do not want to do so with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon, and we will talk face to face. Peace to you. The friends here send their greetings. Greet the friends there by name. Guys, John is writing something fascinating, but I want to start off with a story. I want you to picture for just a second that you are driving down the interstate, maybe heading towards Chicago on a six or eight lane interstate, and you begin to realize you're, you're entering a construction zone. You see the orange barrels, uh, you see uh, all the lights indicating that things are about to happen, and you see that sign with a guy who's obviously supposed to be using a shovel, but to me always looks like he's, he's using a snow push uh, to push uh, snow out of the way, one of those snow shovels that you push the snow with instead. And uh, you know that it's about to go from, from the speed of the six or eight lanes down to the slow drudgery of two lanes. You, you start to make your way over and somebody lets you in and then you start to let other people in. And slowly but surely everybody's getting down to these two lanes and just making their way. And then you see the one bozo smiling and laughing as he passes everybody because he's driving as fast as he can on the shoulder of the road. When he can't drive on the shoulder any longer, he whips into traffic and traffic real, uh, real quickly, almost causing an accident. And then as soon as he can, he whips back onto the shoulder and, and waves at everybody sarcastically as he passes people. How's your blood pressure doing right now? Mine would be up. We all know people who have to be first. They don't mind others being second, as long as that's a far off second, but they have to be first. They have to be the center of every story, uh, in, in the front of every picture. Everything has to be about them. John's writing today about two different people, one of which has to be first, and the other of which, well, recognizes that his Lord said that the first will be last and the last will be first, and that his Lord was constantly living out the life of a servant, even though he was the master. So let's talk about this, and let's begin with, with John's greeting. So his greeting is, Dear friend, I pray that you enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. This is a typical ancient Near Eastern uh, greeting. We do the same type of thing. If, if you write a letter or an email to somebody that you haven't seen in a while, there's a really good chance that you're going to say, I hope your family's doing well. I hope things are going well with you. There's nothing unusual about this, except for the fact that John takes this typical ancient Near Eastern greeting and he adds one little thing to it, which suddenly makes it something uh, that that is teaching us that we need to be faithful. He sets the state of Gaius' soul is the standard by which he wishes him health and prosperity. He, he's saying, I know your soul is doing well. I know uh, that you are living out and walking in the truth, and therefore I hope that the rest of your life is going as well as this. Now this is not some biblical principle that if, if you follow Jesus uh, accurately, therefore you're going to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. That's not what it's saying. Instead, he's setting up the standard to make a different point. It, it's kind of actually uh, like some of the things we do where we set up standards and we say, I wish this would be like this. Well, some of my personal favorites right now actually uh, have been where people are using uh, sports analogies for some of the physical distancing we're doing. 
Uh, I've seen a lot of people that have, have said you need to be as far apart from each other as your favorite team's rival misses a pass. Uh, case in point, I'm going to put a photo up right now of a sign that was in a Chicago um, uh, restaurant. It was telling the patrons that they needed to be 10 feet apart, and if you didn't know how far 10 feet was, imagine Mitch Trubisky missing one of his receivers, then you'll know how far away 10 feet is. I love this. Snark is awesome. Sports snark is the best. And, and what John's doing is he's using a positive example to say, I hope the rest of your life is going as well as uh, your uh, spiritual life is going. And he knows his spiritual life's going, going well. And we're going to talk about that, but I want to pause for just a second. I want to talk about our health. Now, I am not a medical professional, and I am not an epidemiologist, and you should not be looking to me for medical advice. In fact, I would tell you, be very careful about who you take medical advice. Just because somebody can search on Google does not mean that you need to trust them with your health. You should trust people that have put in the time and the training and the practice to hone their skills. If they were not able to go to the medical training that was necessary because they were not able to, to do that schooling or they chose not to, I would seriously question whether or not you should uh, listen to them when they're disagreeing with your doctors and your nurses and the epidemiologist. Trust people who've put in the time. But while I may not be a medical professional or an epidemiologist, I am somebody who prays with people quite often. And I lead you guys in praying quite often. And John is saying that he hopes that Gaius' health is good. And it is not just appropriate, it is good for us to pray to God and say, God, protect our health. It's an act of trust. It's an act of us saying we are dependent upon you. So I, I want us to pause right now and pray for our health. Now, this is awkward for me because even though I'm praying right now, uh, tomorrow morning, I'm going to be about 20 feet that way sitting with my family watching this. And it's awkward watching yourself pray. So instead, I'm going to ask that we pray together through a, a prayer that has been a part of the church for a while. I'm going to put it up on the screen, and I would ask that you pray aloud with me. Oh God, the strength of the weak and the comfort of sufferers, mercifully accept our prayer and grant to your servants the help of your power that our sickness may be turned into health and our sorrow into joy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now let's get back to Gaius' health. He was walking in the truth and he was living the truth. And I think there are two aspects to that that are important. In order to walk in the truth, you have to know what the truth is. And then once you know what the truth is, you need to live out that truth. Now, truth in Christianity is different. It is not some, some written principle or, or biblical tenets. Those are there. But when God wanted to, to, uh, to give humanity his full revelation, he gave himself. He gave himself as a person. That's personal truth. It's intimate truth. That's why when Jesus' disciples asked him and said, we don't know where you're going, where are you going, when he referred to what would happen to him after death, Jesus didn't give, him, give them a map or instructions. Instead, he said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know the Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Jesus is literally saying, if you know me, you know the way. It's this intimate truth. And intimate truth is not just about trivia. You can know a lot about somebody, but you don't know them. We know a lot about celebrities. We see stuff all over the place, but we don't know them. Intimate truth involves knowing people in such a way that there's action involved in it. Because good relationships always shape the way we live our lives. We begin to see the world the way they see the world. We begin to see the world not only with them, but we see it through their eyes. That's what happens with good relationships. So it involves action. And how did Jesus see the world? He saw it as something that God declared, his father declared uh, very good on the sixth day. Every time he looked around at a human, he saw his own image there. He saw the Imago Dei. He saw a world that even the stones cry out to the glory of God. 
how could he not respond in help and in love to a world that everywhere he looked he saw fingerprints and the DNA of his father. See, we need to see the world the, the way that Jesus does because when we do, we're going to respond in love and help. And that's what, what Gaius was doing. He, he was living out the faith and John says he knows he's living out the faith because he is helping the brothers and sisters. And these brothers and sisters are wandering teachers that are going around, which were very much a part of the ancient Near Eastern church. Uh, most churches at the time had pastors that were absolutely wonderful uh, at pastoral care, at taking care of the poor and taking care of the sick and going out and reaching people. And in fact, they died very well. But not all of them had, had the training or the resources to be good at teaching. So what happened was uh, pastors who were good at teaching went around and began to be wandering teachers was such a common thing that one of the earliest books, non-biblical books we have of the early church is a thing called the Didache. It's the teaching of the Twelve. Uh, probably composed somewhere between 50 and 120 AD. And it has sections dealing with how to deal with wandering teachers. Uh, how you should support them and also how to notice when somebody's taking advantage of it. This was a common practice in the early church. And part of that practice was that the church supported them. It was such an important part of the church, this hospitality, that Hebrews references it actually. Hebrews uh, 13, 1 through 2 says this, it says, keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters and do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. For by doing so, some people have shown hospitality in it to angels without knowing it. See, the ancient Near Eastern church took care of these wandering teachers, even though they were strangers they responded to the image of God in front of them. That's what Gaius was doing, and John knows that his soul is healthy as a result. A healthy soul puts others first, just like Jesus did. He, he humbled himself. But we have a different example also. Diotrophes, who's mentioned, well, it says that he loves to be first. If you look back at the letter of John, it says the following, it says, I wrote to the church, but Diotrophes, who loves to be first, will not welcome us. So when I come, I will call attention to what he's doing, spreading malicious nonsense about us. Not satisfied with that, he even refuses uh, to welcome other believers. He also stops those who do, not, uh, do so and puts them out of the church. Diotrophes wanted everything to be about him. We're not sure if he was leading this church or if he was just a member of the church, but the church had to be about him. If he was leading the church, obviously he wanted all the good ideas and all the good teaching to come from him and couldn't stand someone else to get any glory as he saw it. He was not taking care of the flock. There are so many people that want to be first, and sometimes they use Jesus as an excuse of that. But that's not the way of Christ. To, to be first is to worry about yourself when others are hurting. Uh, to be first is to think of your own needs when others have needs too. It doesn't mean that we never think of our own, own needs at all, but the people who are first, well, they're the ones who hoard the toilet paper. <laughs> they're the ones who think if anybody else gets anything else they need, that may mean that I have to go without. They're not the ones who take care of people. They're the ones who hole up and seclude. It's actually one of the things I worry the most about with what we're going through is that we will begin to see the stranger, that we will begin to see our neighbors as a threat and a danger to us. That if they have anything, that means somehow we have not just less, but we have not enough. And we will see them as a threat, that we will avoid them because of some invisible contagion that's on them that, that may hurt us and we have to protect ourselves at all costs. See, Gaius lived out the life that was opposite of Diotrophes because of the fact that he trusted in God. He understood that at the end of the day, this was not about how strong he was or how many resources he had. It was about the fact that he trusted in a God who clothes the grass of the field and the flowers of the field in ways that Solomon would never be able to dress in all of his finery. He understands that we don't have to say, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? 
because he understood that the pagans worry about those things. But we know that our Heavenly Father knows we need them. And he's a good father who gives to us. See, the difference between being first and being faithful is dramatic. Being first is based out of fear. Being faithful is based out of the abundance of God. Being first takes all the toilet paper, takes all of the hand sanitizer, drives down the metaphorical shoulder of the world and tries to beat everyone else. Being faithful sees the world as Jesus sees the world. So my hope for us is that we will be the people who let others in instead of the person who drives down the shoulder. Be faithful. May your soul be healthy. And may we not be the person who love people who love to be first. Would you join me in our closing prayer? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Go with the God who chose not to be first. Go with the God who chose to be a servant. He's got your back. Hebrews 13, 20 and 21. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever, Amen.